just your luck, we're back for another episode. Only today we have Marianne Ackerman. Hello. Local, let's call you a journalist, let's call you a writer, let's call you a gatekeeper to uh, the Mile End. I've been called worse. You've been called worse, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure in your profession. Well, you've been a journalist a long time. Yeah, I was theater critic at the Gazette in the mid-80s. and that's So ancient history for most people. God, so I did what, that what was years. theater like in the 80s? Lots of shoulder pads. Uh, <laughs> There was just basically this, there was the French theater scene, which was very dynamic and going through this amazing period. You had the center. Dynamic had, how? Like they were jugglers? Like how uh, were they dynamic? No, it was the beginning of Robert Lepage. He did a little show oh, called right. Circulation. These people were just in their early, tw mid-twenties coming out with a new kind of imagistic and visual theater. We were coming off a whole wave of political theater. And Quebec was really, you know, the, the theater milieu in French was sowing the seeds for a whole new aesthetic which was pretty exciting. How do you think English theater did? At the time, it was dismal. You had the Centaur doing their, you know, really retread plays. The Sadie Bronfman Center put on a slew of religious plays about Catholicism. They couldn't cope with their own. It was bad. And you had one, <laughs> sounds one struggling alternative company, the Association of Producing Artists out of Concordia, but that was it for English theater. It was very you have a play coming out right now. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Triplex Nervosa. Tell yes. us about it. Well, it's a comedy. Set in Mile End, probably within walking distance of here. What isn't comedic in the Mile End? Yeah, exactly. And it's set, it's about a young girl, and a th woman in her 30s, who has maxed out on her credit cards and her mother's line of credit and bought this triplex, which she can't even afford to live in. Hmm. And she's got all these um, friends slash tenants who are not paying market value rent and who are you know, dragging her down and the bank is squeezing her and she's doing everything she can to hang on to the building. There's one guy on the third floor, the father of a young drug addict who had topped himself and the father's staying there with a grief-stricken father. It won't move. And oh, so it's upbeat. Paralyzed. It's an upbeat story. Oh, it's very upbeat. <laughs> so she and her handyman devised some um, uh, ideas of how to convince him to move and one of the ideas goes very wrong. So it's about the repercussions of uh, a landlord-tenant war. When's this going to come out? Well, it might be at the center. Read, you said. Yeah, they're considering it. They consider. uh, it's being read uh, for the purposes of Centaur looking at it in mid-November at the Rialto. Oh, cool. So we'll see. I think it'll. Also, it'll be performed at the Rialto right across the street. The, the, the public reading. We haven't got a date yet, but it'll be mid-November. Cool. So it may have happened by the time you see this. That's very cool. Too. You're also uh, the founder and editor in chief of Rover Arts. Yes. Dot mm -hmm. com. Yes. It's a dot com, right? It's a dot com. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you look at it that way. <laughs> very official. Mm -hmm. um, and and how's that going? It's going well. We're actually approaching our fourth anniversary. Uh, we've had. Are you, you going to do another posts. art fair? You, uh, you do the annual art fair. Are you thinking well, about it? Well, it's been kind of biannual, all these things. Uh, mm. I had sort of four years of doing any project that came in my mind. And now I'm devoting some serious months to getting the site uh, onto a more solid basis. And we're, we're establishing a number of uh, projects which you hope will lead to a modest revenue stream so we can pay everybody and really entrench the incredible goodwill we have from doing stuff for four years. Well, you know what? It's uh, I think it's a good time. The, you know, the, the mirror is gone, let's be honest. You, you have something you called The List coming out? Yes. This is our big, our big new idea. It's a very... <laughs> It's uh, going to be curated by Matthew Hayes, who's an old mirror man from way back mm -hmm. and still has the weekly rhythm in his bones, is desperate for a weekly deadline. Right. So Matt's going to curate, with all other Rover writers putting into it, a list of 10, 9 or 10 things per week that you really have to watch out for. And we're going out on a limb. We're not just, you know, going to put hundreds of items. We're going out on a limb and like diss a few things, avoid this, go with this. Controversial or not, this is our list from all the art forms and given in ideas given in by our writers. Plays, and movies. Said, exactly. Even something, concerts, something to read, a link to something to read. Sure. An it article. From my old friend Scott Pritchard, who's a he does venture capital, raising venture capital, and I, he called me and said, "You got to get this rover, you know, on its feet. What is this group thing? People volunteering?" And he said, "What I want in my mailbox is once a week. I'm too busy to sift through all this. I want to know what are the things I really should do this weekend." Well, maybe he should focus less on uh, becoming rich and exactly. get out there and mix it up with the rest <laughs> of us. Who is this venture capitalist? Yeah, well, we'll see. He's, he's not a venture capitalist by any means, <laughs> but he puts this together. And so... Tell him, come over. We'll put his finger on the pulse. Well, exactly. Right here. So I said, well, I thought to myself, you know, it sounds like a good idea. And if, I think it'll just be a rallying point. And people will pay 
It's like a financial newsletter. People will pay three dollars a month. We hope, which isn't a lot of money. It's like buy rover a latte. Yeah, $3 exactly. Three dollars a month to be part of our club. Exactly. And we hope through that that um, that subscription list or whatever you call it to really be able to bring all kinds of add-ons of free things and discounts, so members of our group can get these discounts and yeah. and provide a very inexpensive way for people to advertise on the bottom of you know to buy space on the bottom of the list if you're giving something away to people. So it's a rallying point and a way to brand ourselves. This is our taste. You know, we're not right. going to define our taste. We're just going to choose. Taste is everything. Curation exactly. is everything. Yeah, well, this is it. So yeah. And I've also come thought about the whole free world of the internet and everybody wants everything for free. Oh, let me assure you, it's not free. It's not free. Somebody's it making it. costs a fortune. And we spent making. literally $30 putting the show together. I mean, yeah. I won't eat for a month. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> on that note, we have her laughing. We're going to take a little break. We'll play a commercial. We'll be right back. Guess what? We're back again. Okay, no. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the show. Uh, Marianne, um, there's something interesting. I mean, this shows about Park Avenue. You kind of saved Park Avenue. You single-handedly saved Park Avenue. I don't know if you want to take that, that, that merit badge, but yeah. uh, tell us a story. Remember, uh, if you recall, there was a few years ago, there was a whole thing. They were going to change the name of... Park Avenue to Henry Barassa. Yeah. Right? Street? Avenue Robert Barassa. Robert, Robert Barassa. We already have Henry Barassa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm really not good at this job, Marianne. Um, so, yeah. So, tell us a story. Well, I don't know that I saved Park Avenue. I think I you did. I had a little role in the name, the guarding of the name. I know there were all these petitions and uh, really there was so much evidence that people did not want the name changed. Uh, but there was a whole move in Mayor Tremblay and you know how Mayor Tremblay acts totally independent of anybody else's opinion. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I was um, freelancing at the time and I decided to, I saw that Francois uh, Bourassa, the son of Robert Bourassa, who's a, quite an accomplished jazz musician, was had been on tour. I was trying to reach members of the family and get a story. He was on tour, but he was coming back and doing a show at the uh, Centre Pierre Palladeau. So I booked myself in to interview him about, of course, the show at a rehearsal. So I go down and I, you know, do the normal color stuff, but I say to him, and I admit it, it was my plan. You I say, snuck it in. By the way, you've noticed, you've probably heard about this controversy over the uh, change of the street name, and it's clear your father needs some kind of monument. But how do you think he would feel about all this controversy in a petition with 10,000 names against it? He says he'd be aghast. He, my father would never. He was not that kind of man. He was modest. He would never. He was a modest that. man. So he gives me that whole thing, and you know, we talk about it. I phone the Gazette immediately. They say front page tomorrow wow. morning. There's a front page story. Francois Bourassa says family, father would be mortified with all this controversy. The next morning, the mayor called a press conference and said, we're sticking with the Park Avenue name. If the family doesn't want it, we're not going to fight the family. Bless your heart. Now, his mother had been behind the scenes pushing, pushing, pushing. The mother of, uh, the, the wife of uh, Robert Bourassa wanted the name change. She was not. But one member speaks up. And yeah. Apparently, there was friction after that. And, between the two of them. Well, right? thank God, because I mean, what I think we're the only other Park Avenue aside from New York, right? Yeah, I, like, oh yeah, what a terrible thing to be associated with. And on top yeah. of it, our Park Avenue is right next to the mountain, which is designed by yeah. that guy, Olmsted. whatever his name. Frederick Olmsted. <laughs> Frederick Olmsted. Once again, the research department falters <laughs> at Park Avenue tonight. Anyhow. That's he, what I'm here for to me. That's what you're here for, Marianne. Uh, you had a little class of the show. Um, yeah, well, he designed Central Park. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just like uh, Central, you know, when he designed Central Park, I know he was said, you know, my vision will only be 
uh, co come into true fruition mm -hmm. in the early 90s, yeah. which is true. That was kind of like, like, that's when Central Park became perfect. Yes. Perfect. Mm -hmm. And we did a lot of stuff. And th this thing, too, I think when he built this thing, he said it would take 25 years mm -hmm. for the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I'd rather have the mountain... Or Central Park. You ever think about that? It's a totally different concept. I mean, yeah. really, it's only t the same guy. There's not really much in common. I mean, the Mount Royal is... But, I mean, there's they have similarities in the sense that if you... I thought it was great that we could... My husband and I moved in close to the mountain. We've been up twice. You go on a Sunday. It's like it's like in a metro. It's so crowded. What? That much nature with that many tam people. Tam-tams. Yeah. <laughs> Tam-tam. We're opposed to tam-tams. You tam -tams. don't even need to smoke a tam-tam. You can just inhale. Woo! <laughs> Actually, I'd like to know, um, you're, you're, you're a writer, you've written novels, you have another novel coming up, you don't want to talk about it, you don't mm. want to talk about it yet, but uh, what are you reading right now? What am I reading right now? Well, I'm reading a book called uh, The Table Comes First by Adam Gopnik. He's one of my favorite writers. He's a Montrealer. Yeah, that's right. And uh, he, But he works writes for The New Yorker. And this is a book about France, his family, and food and eating. I know food writing is the new porn, next only to decor writing. <laughs> There's so much ridiculously detailed stuff written on food. But he writes very, very well about the tradition of the table, about food writers. It's everything. It's, a, it's probably five or six New Yorker articles together. But it's a way, it just shows that it doesn't matter what you write about. If you're smart and you know a lot, you can be educational and entertaining and make the person want to read your book. And I well, think narrative is over. Book. Story, yeah. plot? Yeah. Give me a break. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> I mean, well, no, but really, I mean, give me a beautiful sentence. Yeah. And I'll read all of yeah, them. Yeah. I'll read them all, one after the other. Yeah. Well, thanks a lot. It, that's actually all the time we have. Marianne, thank you so much for being no on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, have a banana. <laughs> Eat it when you get there. <laughs> and, uh, well, we'll be back next week, as usual, with uh, guests, adventures, mistakes, the usual. <laughs> See you then, everybody. Yeah.